Good morning, LBC Radio. My name is Koi Rosen, and you're listening to the Story Podcast. Today, I have on a super awesome guest who's also a returning guest, Miss Doris Hogalati. Be sure to check out our previous episode we did. She is a Grammy Award winner. She's also an adjunct prof- uh, professor at LBC here and F and M. She's she does incredible work all over the world, and she's here. How are you doing today? Yay. <laughs> Good. Thanks, Corey. Boy, what an introduction. Yeah. <laughs> Make me sound much more important than I am, but thanks. <laughs> yeah, of course. So um, last time we talked about how you became a, a Grammy Award musician, what all that entails. This time I want to talk, talk more about the education aspect and, and uh, how your faith plays into that. So let's, let's start off with the faith. How did you come to Christ and what's that journey been like for you? Well, that's a long one. It is, I'm sure. <laughs> it is. So um, I grew up in Lancaster County. I think I said that mm-hmm. before. Um, and uh, surrounded by fantastic uh, community here. And in particular, even on my street, on both sides of my household, um, we had homes of families who um, are saved. Mm. And so um, through that... I started attending, uh, now not to say I should go back even further. I did, um, I have always been very active in the church. I grew up in the Episcopal Church and, um, you know, was that's baby baptism. That's a whole bit from the start. and was very active, um, had godparents, have godparents. Well, they've since passed away. Um, my parents were very active. They taught Sunday school. We were always in church. I was, you know, an acolyte. Um, if anybody knows what that is, <laughs> I mean, I don't know if they really have, it's candle lighting, right? Yeah, candle yeah, yeah. lighting and carrying crucifix. It's it's well, kind I of was an alkalite. You were you were an alkalite too. Yeah. Do they have those in most denominations and I don't know it? I don't know. I was a Methodist uh oh, person, so okay. No, probably then, whether it's um you know, Protestant or Catholic. The Episcopals are so close to the Catholic Mass that mm-hmm. I was think. Yeah, so it was acolyte, it was in the choir. In fact, that was one thing I remember being seven years old and sitting in the pew and that was um that was a big, very important to me. Like I wanted to be, it was a four-part harmony. It was very traditional, Episcopal music. Um, it's pretty fantastic. And it was always the you know traditional hymns um, from England and from the Church of England. And yeah, so it was important to me. And um, they had just started letting girls in, believe it or not. That mm-hmm. was all boys and men for years and years. And, um, you know, I was going to get great ear training. I The first major instrument I heard was a pipe organ. I was kids, so that's how much time I did spend in church. I was in church all the time. I shouldn't say that um, my parents didn't try to bring me up in a Christian household. They did. Um, but there's a little different than really accepting Jesus as your personal Savior and being saved and understanding what your walk. Means, yeah. It's a very different walk. I mean, so um, on my one side of my household, um, we had a family of Mennonites, and actually... I ended up being best friends with um, the youngest girl. We were both born after uh, older siblings. My siblings are much, much older. Her siblings were. So we were sort of the next generation together. And that side, and on the other side, um, was a very strong uh, faith, faith-based faith household of Presbyterians. And their three daughters, who were more, a little more my brother's ages. But again, um, both families made sure I went to Bible school in, in the summers and such. And I can remember being very young and going to the Bible school with the Presbyterian family. And um, Mrs. Miller, um, the uh, mother of the household, was talking to me about being saved and asked me I want to be saved. And I can remember saying, yes, like I remember this vividly. You know, you have some memories that stick in your head forever. Mm -hmm. And so I did say yes. But I would say, now looking back, I wasn't didn't really understand what I had yeah. taken on as an endeavor and walk, tried to walk the walk. And I mean, I was a really little, I, I don't know, was I in like second or third grade? But if you're not living that 24-7 in your household as well, it's a little hard to really start walking that walk. You're saved, yes. You did it, and, 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 and Jesus is, and, you know, is watching over you, and you are being watched, and by the many angels from above and on earth. But it's not the same as really walking the walk. And I loved Mennonite Bible School, by the way. That was on the other side. <laughs> That's one of my favorites. I still sing the song. <laughs> they did because they had a bell, like an old-fashioned bell, and bring us That's in. That's cool. Oh, yeah, it's old school. I mean, this is in Strasbourg, which still has the, you know, one of my favorite Mennonite churches. 
So I, I love that. And Jody, like I said, my best friend was a, a yeah, she and she is an angel now. I lost her when she was 21. And that was a devastating time in my life, very big change. We were both in our early 20s and I lost her to a terrible accident. And um, oh, um, I know Jody's still watching over me, <laughs> for sure. I know she is. There's no way I would be here. So, yeah, I came, like I said, it was sort of a roundabout way, a lot of bumps in the road, a lot of curves. Boy, nobody's made more mistakes than me. Um, but what happened after that? I've been through my life. Um, my, you know, I still had been just, uh, I went through confirmation, which you may know what that is. Yes. Confirmation is also sort of like the idea of being baptized as an adult. Mm -hmm. It confirms that we were right. So we went through all that. Still a lot of bumps. There was a lot of times that um, I definitely, you know, had, had gone back to scripture and knew I wanted to be on a different path. But it wasn't until a very interesting meeting up and I think everything um, is definitely designed I think you know the Lord already has our lives planned out and so this was definitely planned out and it happens um, it happened about well let's see I know the exact I was baptized September 11th so it's like 9-11 anniversary of 2011 so what's that 13 years ago so I would say yeah so it was like right before that about a year before that there is this um, fabulous human being named Steve Hicks, and he lives in the Rocky Mountains. So he is like, you know, bow and arrow hunting, the whole bit. Well, cool. I don't even know exactly. I'd love to know. I need to get back to the story. But at any rate, I'll get to how I met Steve. My husband runs um, a nonprofit within a nonprofit, so not really, but it is sort of. He runs um, a a rehab group called Catastrophic Relief Alliance, which is sort of like Habitat for Humanity at F&M. Mm. And he started this, he formed this for our students to be able to go and do relief work in, at F. Franklin Marshall College in right after Katrina, after Hurricane Katrina devastated Louis, you know, New Orleans. I mean, it's still a mess. I've been down on those trips. He formed that, and he really wanted to do this. It was very important to him. You know, my husband's an amazing human being. And I don't, he, he, at the time, you know, my husband's an Eagle Scout. He has skills. He has great skills. But I wouldn't say Andy knows how, knew how to hang drywall or lay a roof. You know, in, mm -hmm. he, he survival skills, but not how to build. And if you're going to a place like the Ninth Ward or Lower Nine in New Orleans, you have to know how to read. Right. Rehab. Uh, and not just rehab, you got to build. So I'm not sure how he found some of the adults he did. And one of these these can, these workers who can build a house from scratch is Steve Hicks. So you'd think I never know. Anyway, so he would have Steve. He heard about Steve. He'd have Steve come over and meet. He'd come, you know, over. He'd drive his truck from Georgia <laughs> over to wherever it was, whether it was New Orleans or Texas, like where we've had tons of Houston even having floods. He'd drive there and meet CRA from F&M and teach our kids, do everything. And my husband had said, you know, this is a wonderful Christian, blah, blah, blah. So we also, CRA also does work in Lancaster City. We do things where we work for this community. And so he said, Steve, would you ever want to come up to Yankeeville? <laughs> now you kind of remember people in the South still call us Yankees. He said, do you ever want to come up above the North, the Mason-Dixon line and do something for a week here in Lancaster? And he has this real drawl that sounds like a North Carolina drawl. So, well, um, yeah, you know, I consider that. So basically, Steve came up and stayed with us and was doing our work. And as always, Steve has, you know, the Sabbath is, is pretty holy to him. And on Sundays, no matter where he is in the country or where he is, he will try to find a church and a church where it really preaches the word and he feels good about it, but he'll go anywhere. So my husband says to him, well, you know, where we're working in the south of Lancaster, in the southeast of Lancaster, the people from Ray's Church, um, Temple of Church, uh, Church of God in Christ, have been giving us lunches all this time. I think you'd want to go there. He said, yes, you know, he says, well, I know what coach a church is traditionally African-American. 
He says, yeah, well, when I go to hunting camp in Kentucky, I only go to the African-American churches anyway. That's where everyone's coming. He said, sure, of course. I'd love to go there. So I went there as well. I wanted to get my, because my husband said, I really think you should meet Darlene Bird and all these people and, that are down southeast and are, are wonderful Christians that, you know, given they have nothing, they're given to us to come, you know, they help us to help their community. They're going to give us food. They're gonna, they want you to celebrate there. So we all went, and that was like the bell went off for me. Being with Steve, first of all, the energy, I, I just felt that right there. And he's a very quiet, reserved man. So we're not talking about he's a praise now, because they were. This <laughs> is so, mm -hmm. so loud, you like hold your ears. But just that right there, I knew. I knew so much that when Steve went back down south and next Sunday came, I was going to go hear, um, and I did go hear at the Lancaster Church of the Brethren. I heard their pastor, it was an old friend of mine, speaking. And after that service, I was drawn, I have to go to race. I have to go to the service. And so I, I, I called my brother, who has been a born-again Christian for almost 50 years. And I said, what is this? And he said, well, that's, that's the Holy Spirit calling you. He says, that's exact. I said, I thought so, but I want to make sure. So that, from that point, was was my was my drawing me in and it was at raised temple church of god in christ that um i did get baptized as an adult full immersion in another year later so since then how have you incorporated your faith in regards to teaching playing that's a tough one <laughs> so um as you know i um as a person, just as a human being, I, I like to respect everyone. I've been all over the world, and I know there are different ways of thinking, and I know there are different ways of celebrating um, what someone may feel is God or God's. And I'm also married into a family where my father-in-law was brought up as a Hindu, and a large portion of my husband's family are still practicing Hindus. So um, I think for me, I, I'm, not, I'm never going to proselytize because I can't. But I want to think that somehow the person I am and what I'm doing is definitely a reflection of the light shining through me and, and the fact that God has blessed me in the way I have. So I will always speak to someone, sure. And here, it, obviously, it's great. I feel comfortable here. Right. I, mean, I could talk about the word all day long. But I'm very careful because I, I do not dis want to disrespect. At the same time, I'm, I want to be the walking example. It should be happening. And that's not easy. For me, mm -hmm. I trip up like every five seconds probably. And I try not to, but I'm definitely a sinner for sure. And I wish I weren't. And I try not to be, but I am. And I know that. <laughs> so in, into your teaching now, you teach at F&M, LBC. How, uh, what is, do you have a philosophy of teaching? Well, let's, Let's talk about my position at LBC because it's changed. Hmm. Um, I mean, I was just, um, uh, not just, <laughs> I was yeah, doing some chamber music. I taught some, uh, a couple of fabulous clarinetists. I taught, uh, and you know. An amazing saxophonist. Ama yeah, we've had amazing, I've been uh, blessed. I've um, gotten to, you know, work with the kids side by side, in the orchestra side by side in the shows. Um, Everything. Now I have a position that's called the Director of Instrumental Studies. Mm -hmm. So it's more of an admin, and it's sort of like an assistant to Rachel Sidebotham, who then reports, obviously, to Paul. So it's sort yep. of like assistant there. And um, our goal, I mean, other than I will be, like with Isaac, I'm doing the seminar. I will be coaching chamber music again, which I'm super excited about. Um, but we, we're really working on how can we show the relevance and recruitment of this department to, to students who are now on that path of, no, I really want to study music, but I really may want to go to a Christian-based school. Like, they're not sure. Mm -hmm. So we're, we're working together to um, really make, this, uh, make it known to the masses that we're here. So that's a lot of the goal. So that's, that's going to be tough. Yeah, I'm sure. <laughs> but we're we're hoping to we're hoping to go out, do a little recruitment. I'm hoping to bring along students. That's another thing. I don't want to just like, oh, you know, here I am blown away. I would like to even have a student work with me. Maybe um we had the pianist Katrine. I don't know if you know her. Katrina King, she's she's wonderful. 
if maybe she can go with me and show this like fabulous talent or Ferdinand, you know. For, yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Ma, the, Madara. The bassoonist, yeah. Yeah, like maybe Fer can go with me. There's another wind there and we can play together. I want, I want it that we're showing not only what we have, but what we want to offer and what we, why we want them here, you know, at, at LBC. We'll see, you know. That's not going to be easy. Well, you know, Rachel's amazing, so. Right, of course. Yeah, so we're, we're going, that's, that's our big, that's, that's kind of the mission is to, to go out there and, and show them that you indeed can be a very functioning not just you don't just don't have to be in a praise band or a worship band or you can be a classical and a jazz artist and be a Christian and celebrate that all together at once. Yeah, because uh, that's that's one thing for sure that's been at least growing here is more of the the classical esque instrumentalists. Granted, we have a million and five uh, musical theater and a million and five uh, worship artists. We do. Um, but yeah, it was really getting to the point when I was there where there was more and more classical, more pianists, more instrumentalists that didn't quote unquote fit in the worship band aesthetic. Right. Um, and we want and we want to celebrate that whatever. too, or we want them to try to understand then too, like the worship band or the jazz. But we we want to see show what we offer, you know, we, we now have a community community base well, L B C but community what do I want to say? We fill out some of it with community and student, you know, having an orchestra now. Mm -hmm. We we want to grow on these things. We have we have other schools in the area um, that are Christian-based who do pretty well, but I think that we can show we can offer at least that, that they don't just have to go to somewhere, you know, 50 miles from here or 20 miles from here. We, they can come here, and it's also um, a really good price. <laughs> hate to say it but i mean i know it still seems like it's pricey at lbc but but for the level that you're getting it's not it's not pricey. It, yeah uh, this is one thing that uh constantly surprised me at uh, the level of talent that there is at lbc uh it's incredible like, it is for those who don't know lbc is almost like the launching ground to sight and sound at this point <laughs> Well, that's that's good too, but again, that's our musical theater. Well, well yeah, but still, that, that, I mean, that that goes. To that's so, an example. That's an example, and all the praise and worship people are now heads of like Victory Church or that's Ephra, right, Ephra or um, uh, LCBC or and stuff like that. That's it is. I mean, there's it a, there's a wealth of talent, and I'd like to think that there's a wealth of knowledge to share yeah. from a lot of us. And um, in my case, I'm more in the you know classical into jazz. Yeah, so. Hopefully, um, we'll see. The talent's out there. Um, I think it'll it will be interesting. Um, some we do want to we do want to go out and recruit with some of the the Christian base, like in Delaware County, mm -hmm. the, d around this part of the state, just to say we want you to know we're here, because I think it's been kind of quiet. We haven't we haven't really done that. No. So yeah. we're going to. That's that's our goal, and. We'll see where it takes us. We'll see. You know, we just ha it's a it's the journey that we have to see where God takes us because we don't know, and there's no use in getting uh, upset or anxiety about it. We just have to try. This is it. You know, it's something ex experimental. It's something you have to work through. There's going to be mistakes and there's going to be ups and downs, and you got to figure that out because it's a new program for sure. It is newer. Yeah, and, and it's and uh, Dr. Tharlikson is trying hard. I mean. Like you said, all of a sudden we have a lot of piano. I mean, he he is he has really taken. I mean, he brought back music education. I mean, he's, he's trying, he's trying to really build this, and and make it relevant. And I think if I'm if I'm correct, out of the four Bible colleges campuses, we are the only one with a music department with a major. I think we're the really? only one with a major. We should don't quote. We're not going to quote me on that. Because, um, well, somebody could say, oh, well, she covered herself. She said she wasn't sure. I think we're the ones with the major in the department. So there's no reason, like you said, in this county alone, there's an amazing amount of talent. Yeah. Listen, there's a talent around every corner. Just so it, you know. it, it really is, honestly. There is. I mean, I found that out some years ago. I, you can, it's everywhere. It, it's, it's incredible the, the amount of people I've met through the podcast. And I realize, oh, I've seen you out in the street. Yeah. And I wouldn't have known otherwise. Right, exactly. Yeah, so 
it's um, great. I do, I also feel, I feel blessed that I have a relationship after being at F&M for so long that my relationship with Dr. Brian Norcross there and his large ensembles, which are a- incredibly successful, that at this point when we have a student, like this year it's FERD, we've had other students do this too, that needs a large ensemble experience that we don't have quite built up yet. Mm. He is willing to let them sit there and really experience it and have, so that's healthy. We yeah. need that and and I'm, I'm thankful for that, that we have that relationship. And we've had it now for five or six years. It's been nice. Yeah, and well, I mean, that's kind of how it should, in my opinion. I feel like colleges should do better working together than mm. uh, being apart. And plus, you know, Dr. Norcross is a Christian, and he also is the head of music at uh, First United Methodist. Oh, really? So Yeah, he is. And actually, our choir director, too, uh, Bill Wright is head of music at St. James Episcopal, where I grew up. So, I mean, I, you know, there are people of faith in a lot of places that do want to work and try to give the best opportunities, no matter what, you know, brick, brick building yeah. they're in. You know, right, yeah, like yeah. that doesn't, that's, yeah. we just want to give everybody a chance. And obviously, though, in, within your own school, you want to give those, you're going to give your own school first dips. Of course. And you right. should. And but, you should. But, but this is great that we have, you know, these opportunities here. And, and there's other things um, locally. I would like to see, you know, we have, did I, I don't know if I talked about this last time. Did I say anything um, about Swan for Kids and Sarah Ziegler doing oh, things? No, but, okay. but go ahead. Yeah, well, Swan for Kids, there's a couple of institutions in Lancaster right now. Music for Everyone is probably mm-hmm. the most popular. Yes. And Swan for Kids. They're both. Well, Swan for Kids, um, I, I've had students from FNM and from LBC now working with this and, um, you know, working one-on-one with students after school, working at the camp this summer. We had two students who really, really did well. Um, and the camp was like six weeks. And I mean, they do well. They're, they're really respected. The kids are, you know, our students are paid. These are not like freebie, yeah, just it's, experience only. It's right. They did well. And it was really rewarding. And um, when it, Music for everyone is exactly what it says. Music for everyone. That was to try to get to everyone, and it still does, and it's super successful. Those are the people who uh, provide the pianos in the cities. That's as well. correct. Yeah, I'm funding for so many music programs and schools around here. That's correct. And I've done work with them, and I've been here since um, the beginning of that. I've watched that become an institution, and a dear friend of mine, Mike Jimanis, is a very integral part of that, and he he's a changed person from that. I have to tell you, very much so. But Swan for for kids is also amazing in that you qualify to get this kind of uh, attention and training if you have at least one parent who is um, in prison. Oh, so, wow. right, it's a, it's, a, it's a child who has a parent who happens to be, unfortunately, in the institution of prison, and some have too. So those students are who qualify. So this is an, uh, this is an amazing opportunity for people who really need the support. Yeah, absolutely. And um, it's very successful. And I just saw some writings. Sarah was uh, writing on, posting on Facebook, like how it was an, uh, you know, just an unbelievable experience for her, life-changing, and seeing um, what could be done with these students. And, um, <clears throat> and there is a little bit of a, um, there's two people who actually run it. And the one person is someone very much of faith, of Christian faith. So um, I think, you know, it, it doesn't hurt that that obviously is there for mm-hmm. us that we feel like, you know, we're, we're, we're bringing that. And, you know, all of us, especially our students um, from the Bible College, and um, it's very much celebrated and respected on top of that. But, yeah, um, having family members and having one right now in state penitentiary, um, uh, yeah, this is very, very important and a wonderful opportunity. So, yeah, I would like to see... Um, more of a relationship, a collaboration, you know, during the year, if possible. Listen, col- as you know, Corey, not that long ago, you're not out very long. College students are ridiculously busy. Yes. Some of your own doing, you take on too much. Yes. But very busy and very scheduled. So um, sometimes it's hard to have something up and above that. You have to really, you know, and you're growing up, and it's a very, it's a very tough time, your late teens and your early 20s. But I would like to see if we could have more of our students, especially those thinking about music education, involved with Music for Everyone or Swan for Kids. 
Yeah, that's it's something uh, I've been trying to uh, work more with. I'm having uh, Brendan Sangle, one of the the leaders yes. of F and M, or not F and M. Uh, Med Music MFB, Forever. Yeah. I just texted him yesterday. But yeah. It has nothing to do with us. Right. <laughs> he didn't get back to me. So, <laughs> Brandon, can you hear this? I texted you. Um, and so I'm going to have him on and talk about all that wonderful stuff because it is incredible uh, what they're doing. And you should get, wait till you hear from Brandon, like the specifics. It's, yeah. It's, it is mind blowing with it from where they started. Like, I remember, yeah, it's, yeah, it, I don't know what to say. It's amazing. So, Both organizations are amazing and different. Mm-hmm. So as a, as a teacher, what are some of the things that you have to keep in mind for your students? What are some of the things that you have to address or otherwise? For my students, well, let's, take, let's just take it and look at the pedagogy strictly. Mm-hmm. Uh, let's not even, let's pretend I'm just like, uh, I have no name, no nothing. Let's, just, let's look, look at it that way. I think one of the most important things is that whatever we're doing and whatever we're learning about the instrument or how, how to make it as an expression of yourself, we're going to take that, those tools of discipline and apply them to many parts of our life. I think this is what's tough is to not look at warm-ups or breaking down things or studying as chores or as something um something nasty bad. Or bad something yeah. bad taboo. we know we're just bad just or like oh i'm going to yeah. i'm going to penalize myself because i can't get this we have to take the right because there's a lot of badgering yourself i yeah, mean there's a lot of like which takes all the beauty out of it too and takes the good out of it and makes us a lot of people become a lot of people are turned off and leave it all together and they leave that beauty of that talent they have because of other things like that. The bitterness, yeah. the bitterness is unbelievable, especially in classical music because of the level of a, the high level of being quote unquote perfect. Yeah, the expectation levels are insane. So, yeah, and we've gotten that way in this country and we're finally getting over a little bit of it that, yes, we do need to learn. We do need to learn um, the instrument itself and the f- and right and wrong and the fundamentals very much. And we do need to fix. There's a lot of physical and mental things that we need to fix. At the same time, ultimately, it's supposed to be an expression of ourselves, and we're an extension. So, how do we do that and still do the expression? And mm-hmm. and that's I think that's really tough. And I'm tough. Like, if you go back and I look, I, I'm, ugh. I was brutal 20, 30 years ago. I was terrible. Of course, I was too young and too whatever. But, and I have some, I, I mean, crazy stories. But there has to, with age and maturity, I realized you can be, you could be a disciplinarian and you can be, um, you can be structured and teach someone how to do that. But at the same time, you have got to keep the positive into it. And if you're working as being like being the living example of a Christian to walk in the walk, then you've got this. This is the most important thing after you get everything else. That's just the basics of how to play physically and mentally. So this is a tough road. Everything's a tough road. Everything is a tough road. Are you road. kidding me? Everything. Walking out the door is a tough road. So waking <laughs> up is a tough road. It's or... Waking up without anxiety is a tough road. <laughs> Going to bed without anxiety. Right, or, or just, right, just because we have to get out yeah. of our heads and realize that it's okay. That it doesn't, that's just not that important. It doesn't matter. We have, you're not looking at the full picture. Yeah, that's, that's one thing I want to encourage a lot of people in. Uh, stop looking short term as much. It's very hard because it's so hard. We're brought, we're, it surrounds us. It yeah. surrounds us. How spontaneousness surrounds us everywhere. No, it's it everywhere. Has be, it has to be done now. It has to be done now, or it's never ever going to get done ever. Or uh, I need instant gratification now. Instant gratification seems to be our biggest right. And, yeah, and that we're just not living in the moment and living life. And we're not it's real. Very hard. Yeah, very hard. I find it to be very difficult. It, yeah, I'm getting better, but a lot of people don't realize that the the, the, the 
the decisions that you make now. Like if you're if you're a person who uh, if if you want to plan five years, ten years ahead, you have to be able to map that out. You can't just say, "Oh, I, I want some," because a lot of the instant gratification isn't going to happen right now. It's going to happen later. That's right. It's it's prolonged going, gratification. It's not going to be instant. That's right. right. Yeah. That's right. Uh, and and people need to realize that because all these expectations of instant gratification, especially with, with, with like going viral or something like that, that takes years. And maybe it doesn't. And maybe someone, it doesn't. But that, that is not what not life is about. It's not the point. And we don't know what stumbling block that person could run into. Right. It's a, we don't know. It's You have to live and be the best you are, the best example of walking the walk that you can be. You can't be anybody you're not. And that's really hard. It's, and there are cultures that make it very difficult that you're expected to be a certain way. Mm-hmm. And it's very difficult. So how has your uh, teaching style changed over the years? You, you mentioned how you... <laughs> it's changed a lot in the last, I'd say, 10. And that's about right, 10 to 13 years. Um, well, first of all, um, instead of just... I know how, especially because now, I mean, there was the Pennsylvania Academy of Music for years, and that was pre-college being a person. Now that I'm in co- with the college, I can't assume, and it's not that I don't trust the student, but I can't assume they always have the time to warm up. Mm. So I want someone to physically and mentally, and I can do it with them a little bit, warm up with me. I take that 10 minutes, or 15 of the, like 10 of the lesson, I'm saying, we're going to do this. We need to do this because you're running from this class. You run. We need to, to like, relax. we need to like get in the right place and we need to warm up together. And so that's something I started taking on, like I said, about, yeah, over maybe four, halfway through, 14 years ago. And I see a very major difference in the product when we do that. Because, like I said, we're all. You know, you're running from this to that. Think about when you would go to like, you're like, uh, you know, mm-hmm. let's get in the moment. Let's do it. And let's also get rid of this stuff. Let's just, we need to shut it and know what we're doing and why we're doing it. And that's helped a lot. That's helped a lot. Or not, um, let's see, oh, I'm sure there's stories from F&M students for like 20 years. I know there's some funny stories. Well, no, funny they are, but pretty bad, like just, Funny, yeah, funny now. Funny now, but pretty rough. I remember. I don't think I know, said this in the last one, but I remember taking rubber bands and <laughs> shooting with someone's fingers. I can't remember. I think this was the student. Oh, I think I said this in the last interview about Will Murray, who taught me how to flutter tongue because he was shooting aliens out of the sky. Did I tell you about that? No, not at all. Well, it's unbelievable how you learn things. I taught a student circuit breathe. I learned flutter tongue from a student. I learned don't. You learn from your students. If you're a good teacher, you can learn. Well, this tune, Will was at the time, I think I might have said this last one. Will at the time is uh, was about seven. So he was very young. That's a young student for clarinet. Really interesting guy. He actually um, has beat Hodgkin's disease twice oh, wow. with bone marrow transplant the last time when he was 17. And um, he works for Howard Stern. So, wow. wow it's going to go over a loud BC. Yeah, he actually, um, yeah, Howard Stern had a lot to do with his healing. So it was important to him. And he is still with Howard Stern. He's a producer. He's one of the, he he's works right up there. But anyway, Will, Will was like seven. And to get him, and this was like ADHD to extreme, but super interesting guy, at really creative. But to get him to stay focused for more than five seconds was a feat. Um, yes. And his dad is British, so his dad was basically wanted me to just backhand him. Oh, <laughs> I mean, no. He was just like, just smack him. Well, I'm like, yeah, that's probably that's not, not going to work. work. Yep. Yeah, probably shouldn't do that. Probably shouldn't. But if I get to the point where I'm going to freak out, maybe I will. Well, I remember taking rubber bands, doing his figure. I was like, well, I'm going to start snapping these rubber bands. You know, like I'd take it, well. That didn't work, of course, because none course, of that right, works. Yeah, right. you, you, and when you're like, I was like, what, 22 or 3 teaching him? I don't know. I was super young. So one time, Will was very creative. He wrote like this short story that was basically like Stephen King. He's, he's, And he was like, this is a little older now. He's now like in fifth grade. 
And I said, read me some of the story. I was like, okay, that's a little disturbing, but it's really well written and it was <laughs> odd. But at the same time, he started talking in the story about aliens in the sky or some ships, aliens. She's like, well, what are you? So he had his clarinet. He took it up like, like you know, like Star Wars, and he's going, I'm like, well, what are you doing? You're driving me out of my mind. You're trying to, like, put me in an early grade. He goes, I'm shooting aliens out of the sky. I'm like, okay. 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 And then it, like, all within a millisecond, it dawned on me. I was like, do that again. And he goes, and he starts doing this sound. And first of all, when he did it, his embouchure was right because you're going, and he's mm-hmm. so he, so it was like my relationship of how can I get him to now put the clarinet in his mouth with the proper lower lip embouchure. So I found a way here, but more importantly, the way he was doing that, it sounded to me like he was rolling his R's, mm-hmm. and that would be how you would flutter tongue on a clarinet. So I said, "Will keep doing that, keep doing it." It was this like fast air, you know, and then I said, "Now bring down your clarinet and put it in there." And so he did it, and he got this perfect flutter tongue sound. And until that time, I couldn't flutter tongue properly. Really? So Will taught me how to flutter tongue by shooting alien ships out of the sky. That's funny. So you never know. Yeah. Hey, Will Murray ended up in state band through cancers, and yeah, you know, it was great. It's, it's incredible the the, the the stuff you the the important mind boggling stuff you learn through the stupidest way. Or what seems to be the stupidest ways. Well, I mean, it was better than hitting him with rubber bands. Of course, right, yeah. I let him talk about his story and what he was doing, and I thought, he's the guy. I mean, yeah. In the end, we worked on his embouchure, and I learned how to flutter tongue properly. Yeah, he went on to be a really fine bass clarinetist. That's awesome. Yeah, there's a lot of... Um, and also, one of my students, <clears throat> Allison Young Kane still lives in this area. We're still good friends. She is a grandmother now, believe it or not. And she was a young mother. She was uh, had her first child in her senior year at McCaskey, and she was pregnant at Allstate Band. Well, which, thankfully, um, all has gone well. She has a beautiful family. It was also Allison who brought me to the Lord. She had been talking. It's funny how this works. She was um, receptionist at my family doctor. And and we had stayed in contact through all this because she was still in Lancaster County and she got married and everything. And um, she kept telling me about Raised Temple Church of God in Christ. And she would always say every time I was in there, I'd love for you to come to my church to me. You have to someday, Doris. You have to someday. And that's the one that it turned out to be in the end. So you never know how the Lord works. The Lord works in so many ways that we cannot understand. It's We cannot understand at all. It, it's so, it's so crazy the situations I've been a part of just because I was like yeah why not, right right and and people just like offhandedly suggested go to this and you're like okay okay I guess I guess and then and then it turns out to be this it, wonderful amazing thing it, right it was like something that completely like I said she kept kept saying I thought what church is she talking about like what is she talking <laughs> about and lo and behold. And we've been to services now. Obviously, we ended up at the services a lot of times. We would go to funerals, um, weddings, you know, everything. So, um, yeah, you never know. So this being a shorter podcast, we're uh, slowly running out of time. So oh, sorry. Yeah, I didn't look at my – I can no, no, rattle on all day. Uh, <laughs> Nobody wants to hear it, but I can rattle on. No, it's great. It's fine. Um, what is – how has your faith been challenged or grown throughout uh, your career? Um, I'm, I'm stumped on the challenge. <laughs> I would say my faith has grown very much so by conversing and having... Um, either colleagues or what became friendships with people of other faith, Hmm. interestingly enough. And I don't mean to say that it made me feel like my my way is right and I know that this is the the path and because the only way you saved is it. That's not what I'm saying. I'm saying that I think watching people 
being that strong in their conviction of what they believe made me realize that I am very strong and I'm stronger in what I believe and at the same time respect them. So I would say that was one, that's one of the most important things that's happened is, is that um, seeing that as opposed to you would think that maybe I would feel intimidated, like the opposite mm-hmm. would happen. No, I would say probably fair. Because for a while, when we lived on West Ross Street for over 20 years, it was a very interesting community right outside of FNM. Um, there were neighbors, there was a Muslim family we were close to, a Mormon family. Yes, I realize a Christian, but it is different. Mm-hmm. It's very different. And I've actually spoken with um, the, uh, missions, the missionaries that come through. Um, a Catholic family, um, then evangelical, which is more Ray Kojic across that was Dawn I met. And so there were there was quite a diversity, plus people of color, people who were, you know, it was, so I would say um, it was really, it was really, knowledge is still, you know, the best, the greatest thing we have. And it was great to, to listen and to, and to, listen and respect and celebrate their their faith. Even though I like sharing what I believe, and I should, because mm-hmm. that's what I'm supposed to do, witness. But it was interesting to do that, and it's interesting to be married into a family where a large portion are Hindu. Because that's also cultural. So yeah. a lot of times, too, I mean, for our friend Sam, um, he married a Christian, but Sam is from Morocco. It's culturally, too, an extremely... Um, you know, Islamic state. So it is a, it's very, um, it's very eye opening. And it's, I think for me, it's very healthy. Maybe not for everybody, but it is. And that's, it's also good because I'm older. It's one thing when someone's bombarded that who's very young, then it can be very confusing. Mm -hmm. So yeah, uh, longevity creates stronger uh, faith. And you have, you're, you're grown you're mature enough to be able to understand what you're listening to and how to celebrate it without condemning it or without um, feeling like, it. or feeling like, well, maybe I'm wrong. Oh, yeah. See, you don't, yeah, no, right. I don't lose my faith. But it's very, yeah, it's very good. It's very important um, as an adult, I think. It'd be great. I don't know. I've been through that. Yeah. So... Yeah. What is uh, one of your biggest supports? What is one of uh, your biggest encouragers to this day? Well, support system in general, uh, there's no greater support system than my husband. <laughs> Nobody has a husband like, well, somebody I'm sure does, but um, because we're, we were not, also we're not blessed with children. So it does make, if you, if you have a really strong marriage and you have no children, it does make for a very strong bond. And my husband um, has been an incredible supporter of my career from day one. I mean, there's no, it's pretty amazing. I mean, everybody who knows or witnesses this. Uh, so I would say of everything I do in my career, in particular my husband, I would not, I will say um, my husband respects what I believe is faith, but we are not exactly on the same page. Mm. Brought up in a very different Right, right, of course. Like, but he does respect it, and he does understand it. But he has to come to the Lord on his own. I can't. That's like so anything. His brother did. His brother came to the Lord, like, I'm going to say about 20 years ago, 23 years ago. Um, and, you know, there are people who come to the Lord who are not vocal about it either. So we have to, I have to respect that. What has been one of your biggest blocks, busts, rejections, and how do you deal with that? Uh, that's a good question. The biggest rejection, you mean in my career? In your career. My rejection was um, back when I was 18. Um, very strong influence of mine and my teacher were both graduates of the Curtis Institute, and this was why I was at Peabody. And they desperately wanted me at Curtis, being the Curtis Institute. So they, you know, 
we got me through to the final group and um, I auditioned and I was down to the last two. And um, the clarinet professor at the time asked if he could take in two students and he couldn't. So he chose the boy over me and he was known to have specific feelings about females. Um, you know, why would you bother? They're just gonna get married and have kids and stuff. So, and at, end up leaving the career, right? Yeah, like why would I waste yeah. a free, incredible education at Curtis and get them in an orchestra when they're gonna waste it? And so, at the time, it was a little mind blowing, but it wasn't too bad. But looking back, um, yeah, it's pretty funny. But I know that, again, that would not have been the right move. Mm -hmm. Staying where I was, growing more, and then actually doing my master's at Michigan was probably the best path, and I wouldn't have done that out of Curtis. So this was, and it's funny, most of my colleagues are graduates at Curtis, so it's pretty funny, but I think that was a, a blow at the time, and not even right then, but later, because mm -hmm. um, you do see in classical music, you do see the opportunities given by connections. And yes. that's everything in life, but you really see it. I have been very blessed. It was a different path than most, and I luck, you know, there's a reason. God, yeah, no, this, is for, yeah. this is who I'm supposed to be. If, if, and so how, how then do you deal with that rejection? Well, I deal with as a mature adult realizing that definitely that would have been a mistake. Mm -hmm big mistake because I would not have gotten the training of understanding how to break down. It, before you express yourself on the instrument, like we were saying earlier, you really do need to have a command of the fundamentals. Yes. You have to have the physical command of how you work with that as an extension of you physically. So um, I had a very, I was doing something in art, my articulation that was very wrong. And my teacher at Peabody, great artist, but he could not teach. And so he couldn't, I found it and identified it, and he still couldn't figure out how to fix it or how, how what I would need to do, and it was the teacher at Michigan that knew how to do that. And he was the one that taught me how to teach. So so. Often, oftentimes our, our biggest rejections that seem so big in the moment, we... we well, they're learning, they're usually they're for great reason. Great reasons and hindsight, you know, 20, it's 2020. Sure. Uh, and then you can realize, oh, well, that's obviously why that happened. It's because if that happened, I wouldn't have done this. I wouldn't be like this. I wouldn't that's be the person I am today. Absolutely. Absolutely. And it's funny. Um, you, you think you can't live in a place like Lancaster County, uh, but you can. And I did. And, I, I, made it, uh, and I, I succeeded. You can do it. You don't have to live in a major city you don't have to follow the path that you think you're supposed to follow you can you can do, it you can on own, do yeah. this yes you can succeed so last question what is uh one one thing uh one uh piece of advice or encouragement to musicians besides that you can do it uh no i yeah um I think the do not okay whether you're going to make your living doing this hopefully or not or you just want to do this understand that you want to try you want to be who you are and try your best but that there is no there is no status of saying this if you make it here that means you made it there. Just do it because you want to do it. Don't do it because, or don't come to major music, or don't study this unless you truly want this. Not because, well, my, my parents bought the instrument and expected. Do this because you feel in your heart you have an expression as an artist, and you want to do this. Like I said, whether it's, making mu whether it's playing as a hobby, it doesn't matter. Do it because you want to do it, not because you feel obligated or you've got nothing better, whatever it is. Don't ever take on something like this unless you really. And I guess that's for anything. That's not that's just, really yeah. Just do it out of the do passion. It for the, do it for the right reason. Yeah, we're in America. Believe it or not, folks, we are in America. Do you? We have choice. We have choice. Don't 
make 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 a choice because you really want to. We're 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 really lucky. We really really let's you know do it because you want to do it and take it on, not because mommy and daddy want you to, or not because you feel obligated because the world thinks you should do 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 what you want. And yeah, you do still have to make a living. <laughs> <laughs> so it may not be right from that at the t- moment. Oh. This has been fun. Yeah. I always love, I love talking to you, Corey. Yeah, I love talking to you too, Doris. This is is always a great time. Um, If you have enjoyed this episode, please be sure to like, subscribe, share. Uh, Tomorrow, not tomorrow, Sunday, we're going to (laughs) be having on another returning guest, RJ Conrad uh, from Rascal Revival. Uh, I think it's a six-piece band. Uh, I could be wrong on that. But a a super great friend, a super great person, friend of mine. I'm excited to talk to him uh, and talk more about his faith and, and his career as well. Last time we talked about how it was like to be a stay-at-home dad and a musician as well. Oh, wow. Yeah, which is really cool to talk about. Yeah. Um, <laughs> talk about exhausting. Oh, right, for sure. <laughs> but uh, yeah, I'm super excited to have him on. Um, you can, If you want to follow us, you can go on, search up The Story, Corey Rosen, C O R Y R O S E N on any and all platforms Spotify, Apple Podcasts, uh, Facebook, Instagram. You can find us there. And if you want to look up future guests and events, check out our Instagram at the underscore story underscore podcast or Facebook, like I said, forward slash the story Corey Rosen. With all that said, I hope you guys have a great, wonderful rest of your day, and we'll see you guys later. Bye. Bye.